All right, welcome back to class. Um, today, we're going to finish up our discussion regarding mechanisms of injury to the shoulder. So we'll do a pretty brief review of what we talked about last class. Um, before we do that, I want to share my screen because um, that's where the lectures are. But also, I handed back or didn't hand back, I virtually handed back the results for the first exam. Now, I think probably what I'll end up doing is I'll scan the exams because I printed them out. I'll scan the exams and send them to you individually via your email. And if you'd like to try to answer any of the questions over again, um, I can only give a recommendation for the grade. If you're okay with the grade that you have, so be it. But if you'd like to try to work on some of the questions over again and improve your answers, I have no problems with that. So I'll scan the exams, send them back to you. And then anything that you'd like to go back to the notes and work on again, you may do so. And I'll keep that option available all the way until the second exam is given. Um, so you should have plenty of time to do the work that you got to do. If you're happy with your grade, then I'm happy with your grade. But if not, then you can always try to improve your work. All right. So that's where we'll go with this exam. So last class, what we did is started to talk about the shoulder and potential mechanisms for injury to the shoulder. So I also want to try to use the same concepts that we are discussing in the beginning of the class for our discussion about the shoulder, the hip, the knee, and the ankle. So an example of that would be, for instance, constraints. All right, so we do have all sorts of different types of constraints. Very simple to think about constraints, but then constraints that are somewhat more complicated. And an example of the more complicated constraints would be order and control parameter. We talked about that. But another example would be functional anatomy. So because your body is connected in the separate limbs and parts and joints of you know one part of the body is connected to the other via ligaments and tendons and bones, movement at one part of the body is going to cause or um, is going to result in movements of other parts of the body. So one of the arguments that we're trying to talk about is, or that we're trying to refute, is that the brain does everything all the time. Now, I think that what we've done now is we've eliminated the need for the brain to be responsible for things that have to do with gravity. We've eliminated the brain in regards to reduction of degrees of freedom. We've also eliminated the brain in regards to transitions that occur because control parameters are manipulating order parameters. We've also eliminated the brain in regards to things like the release of elastic potential in the Achilles tendon. And we've also eliminated the brain's responsibility for all of these resultant movements that occur because of movement in one limb or in one segment of the body. So when the arm is flexed, when the humerus is flexed, there's a resultant motion of the scapula. And that scapula happens just because the humoral, the humerus is flexed. All of these other things happen for free because of constraints and functional anatomy. So what we're trying to do is we're trying to eliminate the need or the, the um, description or the potential explanation of movement um, saying that the brain does everything, this hierarchical motor programming theory, because certainly nothing can do everything all, all at once, without mistake, all at the same time, with a body that can move in an incredible number of positions. So if we can eliminate 
the brains need to do everything and just narrow it down to what the brain needs to do, that's at least easier philosophically to think about. Now, I'm not going to be able to tell you what the brain does at the end of this class. That's not the goal. The goal is to refute the argument that the brain does everything. All right. So right now, I'm just trying to build a case for it not need it, the brain not needing to do everything. All right. So then also what we did last class is we talked about some of the mechanisms for injury. And one of the ways or one of the uh, characteristics of the way that the shoulder is structured has to do with its function. Now, the shoulder needs to be mobile so that it can manipulate tools in the environment. And because of that, its structure has to be a particular way. All right. This joint here, this glenohumeral joint, is not a very deep ball and socket. All right. Let me see if I can show you a different picture of it right here. Now, because of that, it allows for the humeral head to rotate in this shallow little cavity here with a pretty large range of motion. Allows for overhead range of motion. It allows for internal external rotation. Now, one of the things that we didn't mention last class is this little equation here. All right, pressure is equal to force divided by surface area. All right, pressure is equal to force divided by surface area. Now you see here that the surface area of the glenoid fossa is pretty small. Now I'm just gonna draw another picture right here. This isn't gonna be 100% accurate. I'll try the best I can. This is your humerus, all right? This is your humeral head here. This is your greater trochanter on the side of your body. This is your femoral neck. Sorry, this is your femur, your femoral head, my bad. And then this is your acetabulum, your, this, your hip joint, the socket that is your, your hip. And this is just a drawing, all right? But the socket, the acetabulum, is going to surround a greater area of the femoral head here than the glenoid fossa does. So the force of body weight is going to be coming down in this direction, and it's going to force there to be a transmission of force from your acetabulum, from your ilium, to your femoral head and say, wow, that's, that's a lot of force, right? But that's a lot of force that's distributed over a pretty great surface area. And because of that, the surface area is large. And that means the pressure at any point on your femoral head in this socket here is going to be less. The force of your body weight is distributed over a greater surface area, and that's going to reduce the pressure at any point along this femoral head and acetabulum. All right. But when you take a look at the glenoid fossa, there's far less surface area for all of these forces to be distributed which is gonna increase the pressure at any point on the glenoid cavity or on the femoral, on the humeral head. So that's a potential mechanism for injury associated with just the actual structure of this joint. All right, so one of the potential ways that the shoulder can incur injury is just based on this structure itself, based on the fact that this is not a very deep skeletal joint. There's not a huge amount of bone holding this humeral head in. 
So what's holding the humeral head in? Why doesn't the humerus dislocate? Well, it does dislocate actually much easier than the femoral head, but what's holding this in is the bone. I mean, the, the, ligam, uh, the, the ligaments and tendons. So in this case, it would be your acromioclavicular ligament, but then you also have muscles that are holding this particular joint together, all right? You have your rotator cuff muscles that hold this joint together. You have your supraspinatus, you have your teres minor, you have in the back here, you have your subscapularis. So you have all sorts of different muscles that are gonna be holding this joint together, all right? So it's not a skeletal, um uh integrity integrity structure it's more of a, a muscle integrity structure all right so if there's an issue with those muscles though then all of a sudden this relatively unstable joint is going to remain unstable so we'd have to talk a little bit about the musculature involved and if there's an issue with the musculature involved then there could potentially be an injury to the joint. We'll get that, we'll get to that when we talk more about the rotator cuff muscle today. So we also talked about um, a different mechanism of injury, and that would be associated with this ligament that goes or attaches from your clavicle to your acromion process right here, your acromioclavicular ligament. All right, so we talked about a particular mechanism of injury to this ligament would be exactly what we talked about with stress strain curves. Now, if you load this ligament with very low intensity forces, like I am lifting a feather all day, well, I might incur particular forces on this ligament they, you know, I might incur forces in many different directions, all right? I might incur forces in this direction or in this direction here or in this direction here. But if those forces aren't at a great enough magnitude to start to break down those collagen and elastin fibers, those crisscross fibers of a ligament, if they're not strong enough to break these little fibers down, then there's not going to be a problem. But if these forces are large enough to start to break each one of these collagen fibers down, then what ends up happening is a weaker and weaker ligament until finally there's going to be some type of tissue um, injury, which potentially you push that ligament into its plastic region. And then if the forces are high enough, so if your forces are high enough and it starts to break down that ligament and then the time that you give for that ligament to heal is not long enough, then all of a sudden what you have is a situation where you have your ligament is going to enter the plastic region and start to break down and then eventually it's going to rupture. All right, so that's a loading problem. That's a healing problem. That's too much force problem. If the force isn't high enough to break down those collagen and elastin fibers, not a problem, right? Now, for me, the forces were high enough to start to break down the tissue here, but I gave enough time and I redesigned how I was coaching so that I was able to alleviate the problem. But that's another potential mechanism for injury to a joint in the shoulder. All right, and then the last thing that we talked about last time in regards to our mechanism of injury at the shoulder was it had to do with torque force and distance. All right, so right here, this is your sternoclavicular joint right here. Whoopsies. 
getting there. We're getting there. One of these days, I'll perfect what I'm doing. Here's your sternoclavicular joint. And that's the only skeletal attachment of your entire shoulder girdle or your shoulder complex to your axial skeleton. So if I'm holding a weight, all right, in my hand down here, if I hold a weight here, that weight has a particular force. And that force is going to pull my arm downwards into this direction. Now, the line of action of that force is in this direction here. And here's the axis of rotation. So you have a force associated with whatever is in my hand, whatever weight is in the hand. And I have a distance here. So that means that this force here is creating a torque. It's creating a torque that's making this clavicle want to bend in that direction. Now, if this joint here, if the skeletal structure here is strong enough to withstand the torque, then you don't really have a problem. But for my mom, who is a 65-year-old woman, probably, you know, definitely post-menopause with probably already more brittle bones and less calcium because of hormonal changes and stuff in her joints. To me, I, I, thought, I thought when she told me that she was going to start bench pressing, I thought that this was maybe a little bit of a, a concern because I think that she only focused on the fact that she only focused on the fact here that this was 10 pounds. It's only 10 pounds, Daniel. I'm not lifting too much. And I said, yeah, I know, but that 10 pounds here is acting at a distance away from this joint. So it's not just 10 pounds. It's torque. It's units of torque. And I don't know if her personal trainer or if she had considered that. Now, what happens if, say, for instance, I have this 10 pounds, but the 10 pounds is now being distributed a little further away from the sternoclavicular joint because she's doing wide grip bench pressing. That just takes the weight here and moves it even further away from this axis of rotation. Sure enough, about three weeks after my mom started to do bench pressing, she dislocates the sternoclavicular joint. All right, and I just don't know if she was necessarily understanding the impact of this 10 pounds acting at a distance away from the only axial connection between the shoulder and the axial skeleton. So just another potential mechanism of injury at the shoulder or one of the joints of the shoulder associated with some of the terms that we've already been going over. All right, now, if this is an overuse injury, then anybody who uses a weight that's acting at a distance away from the sternoclavicular joint could become injured, but it's not necessarily overuse. If you overuse and the amount of force that you're lifting isn't high enough, right? If this right over here is only 10 pounds, well, then it might not necessarily be enough force to start to break down this joint here. Or if instead of wide grip bench pressing, you do um, shoulder width bench pressing and you reduce this overall distance here, then it might not be an injury. So it's not the case that it's overuse. It's the case that it's overuse with a number of these different variables factoring, factoring in that is going to, and these are all kinematic and kinetic and variables that are measurable. These are all, you know, predictable problems in some instances. All right. So those were the three mechanisms for injury 
that we discussed last class. Now my external hard drive just fell out of my computer. So if this stuff uh, screws up, then give me a second to try to fix everything. So that's what we did last class. All right, does anybody have any questions about those three mechanisms for injury? Okay, that's what we talked about last time. So this class, what I wanna do is talk about another potential mechanism for injury at the shoulder. And that mechanism for injury has to do with the rotator cuff and actually what the rotator cuff does. So I'm gonna get out of this presentation here and I'm gonna do and open up the next presentation, this one here. One second here. Slideshow from start. So the rotator cuff is something we all talk about, but you know, sometimes when I work with the kids in the gym, they have no idea what the rotator cuff is and why it's called a rotator cuff. So there are four muscles in the shoulder that make up the rotator cuff. There's the sub scapularis. Sub means under and scapularis is the scapula. So this muscle is actually underneath the scapula. It's between your shoulder blade and your ribs. It's actually really difficult to stretch. And if you're doing deep tissue massage, because it's underneath a bone, it's actually hard to foam roll or hard to get loose or hard to work on. But this is one of the muscles here, the subscapularis between your shoulder blades and your ribs. I'll show you a picture of it. The next muscle is your infraspinatus. Infra is below and spinatus. So it's below the scapular spine. Likewise, this one, the supraspinatus is above the scapular spine. And then you have this teres minor. There's also a teres major. And you would think that the teres major is part of the rotator cuff, but it's the teres minor that's part of the rotator cuff. And these muscles start with the letter S, I, T, S. And oftentimes they're referred to as the sits muscles. All right, so these are the rotator cuff muscles. Now, there are a number of different shoulder muscles that you might consider part of the shoulder and you might not. All right, there are shoulder muscles that are very close to the glenohumeral joint but there are also extrinsic shoulder muscles like the lats and the pecs. All right, so we're gonna talk about the rotator cuff. And it's called a rotator cuff because when you cuff things together, like if you have a blood pressure cuff on and you tighten the blood pressure cuff, what the cuff does is it squeezes your bicep and it pulls all of the tissue of your bicep together. So it cuffs your, your arm, all right? It increases pressure surrounding the arm so that your arm tissue actually gets closer together. That's what a cuff does, and that's what your rotator cuff does. So I'll show you what I mean there. Hopefully these pictures come up, why wouldn't they? Oh, I understand. Um, give me one second. I'm gonna have to plug this. Uh, I'm gonna have to plug this in and open this presentation again so I get all the pictures. Sorry, just give me a second for my external hard drive to to boot up again. Let me get out of this. Where are you? All right. Hopefully, this solves the problem. Uh, it. This should do it. This should do it. 
All righty, all righty. So let's just talk about the rotator cuff, all right? The lats, the pecs, blah, 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 blah. Coracle brachialis, but this is the fun stuff, the rotator cuff. Now, the rotator cuff is somewhat unique in terms of where these muscles attach to the humerus. So this is your subscap. You'll notice that this rib here usually comes around. This rib comes around. This rib here would come around like this, right? But all of these structures here are erased so that you can see underneath the ribs. This is between the scapula here and the ribs, all right? And you'll see that the subscap attaches all the way at the medial border of your scapula, all right? And it attaches to the um, lateral and medial aspect of the humerus. So when this muscle contracts and gets shorter, it's going to pull this aspect of the humerus towards the muscle. It's going to cause some flexion or, sorry, adduction of the arm. And it's also going to cause internal rotation. So internal rotation. Now that's going to be important when we're talking about throwing a curveball later on and potential mechanisms for injury because when you throw a curveball, there's a huge amount of external rotation, all right, of your arm when you throw a curveball. So what is going to stop that arm from externally rotating? Well, that's going to be stopped by the subscapularis firing eccentrically all right and if i can't fire my subscapularis eccentrically enough then the external rotation associated with the curveball is going to cause too much external rotation the subscapularis isn't going to be able to absorb all that force and you're going to potentially push the subscapularis and the tendon associated with the subscapularis into the plastic region. So one potential mechanism for injury here is the imbalance between your concentric and your eccentric, if they're not equal or, and I don't wanna say equal necessarily, but if there's no balance between them in terms of their ability to fire, then you potentially have a mechanism for injury. But it's not just the intensity or the strength, all right? It's not just strength, it's timing, all right? The, the timing between those muscles firing is also going to be important, all right? So muscle strength and timing is a key here. So one of the things that we should consider is where these muscles attached to here. They attach to the lateral aspect of this humeral head. So when the muscle fires concentrically and the muscle shortens here, all right, and you remember here is the outer, the outer, um, I'm just going to draw the humeral head like that. And now you have your glenoid fossa like this. When the muscle gets shorter, the muscle is going to pull this aspect of the humeral head towards the glenoid fossa. And it's also going to take the scapula here and push the scapula closer to the humeral head. So it's going to like increase the stability of this attachment here. It's going to cuff or close down the space between the humeral head and the glenoid fossa. All right, now if I look at the next muscle, all right, the next muscle, whoopsies, and let's go clear all drawings. 
and go like this. Then the next muscle is the supraspinatus. This is looking from the back view, and this is your scapula. This is the scapular spine. This muscle attaches to the, again, the medial aspect of your upper scapula here. And you'll see the muscle also attaches to the lateral aspect of the humeral head over here. So when this muscle shortens and fires, it's going to cause the arm to rotate around this pulley. It's going to create an a motion like this, abduction. It's going to pull the humerus in this direction. But again, you'll notice if this muscle here shortens here and the muscles go towards the center, all right, this muscle firing concentrically is also going to take this portion of the humeral head and move it that way. Let me just change the color so it's easier to see. It's going to take this and move it that way. And when it moves it that way, it's going to force the humeral head into the glenoid fossa. It's going to decrease the space between these two bones here. Like it's cuffing the joint space. All right, so that's why these muscles stabilize the glenohumeral joint. It's not skeletal structure that stabilizes these joints here. It's the muscular structure that when the muscles fire concentrically, it packs this joint space and tightens up and stabilizes the shoulder. All right, so let's look at the the next rotator cuff muscle. Same thing here. All right, same thing here. This is your infraspinatus. This is the scapular spine. And this muscle attaches to the medial aspect, posterior medial aspect of the scapula. And again, attaches on the lateral posterior surface of the humeral head. Now, when this muscle shortens in this direction here, all right, it's going to cause the humerus to rotate in this direction, all right? But because it's attached to the lateral aspect, when the muscle shortens and this part of the, hello, and the muscle kind of like comes together in a concentric contraction here, again, what it's going to do is it's going to take the humeral head and it's going to move it towards the acetabulum, which is here. Again, stabilizing, reducing the, the joint space here. All right? So all of these muscles work together to jam the humeral head into the glenoid fossa. All right, let's take a look at the last muscle. The last muscle is, again, your teres minor. And you'll see that the teres minor is doing pretty much the same thing. All right, you can see here is the origin of the muscle. The insertion point of the muscle is on the lateral aspect of the humerus. And when these muscles fire, they're going to decrease the joint space in the glenohumeral joint. That's why they're called the rotator cuff muscle group, because what they do is they cuff the shoulder together. Now, let's go back to this view here. I like this better. So that's why, the, that's why these muscles are referred to as the rotator cuff. Now, let me just try to complete this drawing here a little bit. All right, let's go like this. Let's just draw in, all right, these muscles here. All right, and I have another one that's coming underneath here. 
and to here, this is your Terry's minor. Okay, now, you have four different muscles. You have the six muscles. There's one, two, three, and four muscles. All right, now, if we have four muscles, what happens if the muscles themselves aren't strong enough? And when I say not strong enough, we have to consider two things. We have to consider their concentric strength, all right? But we have to also consider their eccentric strength, okay? Now, when, say for instance, the, the humerus externally rotates, it's the muscles that are going to allow for internal rotation concentrically that cause e internal rotation that are going to fire eccentrically to slow down the external rotation. So if you have a young baseball player and they're throwing curveballs, if their subscapularis muscle isn't strong enough to eccentrically slow down the external rotation of the arm while you're while the curveball is happening. It's just going to take that subscapularis and cause too much force to go through that muscle for too long a period of time and potentially push the muscle into the plastic region. Now, if that little kid is throwing a ball 75 times a day, five days a week, or if that little kid is asked to pitch four consecutive days, for three months long because he's the best pitcher on the team. I mean, you got a mechanism for injury right there associated with the eccentric strength of that muscle. Right, so that's one potential mechanism of injury, this balance between concentric and eccentric strength. All right, so that's one thing that we could discuss in regards to the rotator cuff, but we also have another thing that we, we have to consider. Number two that we sometimes forget about is timing. Now, what happens if, say for instance, the muscle itself fires, let's go like this, A. What happens if the rotator cuff muscles are supposed to stabilize this glenohumeral joint what happens if they fire just a little bit too late? So the joint is supposed to be stabilized now, and the muscles fire two, three milliseconds late. What happens then? What happens if there's latency? All right, and I'll even go late latency. What happens if there's latency? in the firing of these rotator cuff muscles so that the glenohumeral joint is packed or is cuffed a little bit too late. Zach, what do you think there's gonna, what do you think the result of that is gonna be? They wouldn't be able to slow the force down, so it would probably um, pull on the, the humerus and possibly um, push the um, the, uh, <laughs> the, uh, <laughs> I'm sorry, I'm blanking, but it would push them probably into the plastic, um, region. That's what I would think. I think that yeah. the easy thing to say is if there is latency in the firing of the rotator cuff muscles in their entirety, it's certainly going to hamper or decrease the potential stability of that glenohumeral joint. And if that's happening while somebody's throwing a baseball or a football or something like that, then there's going to be too much force going through this joint for too long a period of time. And that certainly could push those tissues into their plastic region. So that's one thing that we want to consider. And the other thing that we want to consider is, let's say you have four different rotator cuff muscles. You have your sits muscles all right so you have your subscap 
your infraspinatus, your teres minor, and you have your supraspinatus. Which muscle fires first? There's four of them, so they can't all fire immediately at the same time. That's just not how things work. So there's got to have to be some type of optimal firing strategy so that these muscles fire in the right sequence. It could be that you think that the subscapularis should fire first, and then the teres minor, and then the infraspinatus, and then the supraspinatus. Or, or it could be in some other order. But what happens if the timing is without order? Or what happens if the timing is not synchronized effectively? All right? What happens if they're not synced? All right, effectively. Well, I would say probably the same thing. All right, you're going to have a difficult or a reduced ability to stabilize this glenohumeral joint. If that's the case, you're going to potentially push all of those tissues into their plastic region. Yes, Zach. So is the is the order depending on the movement that you're doing, or is there like a set set way? Well, when you take a look at the homework assignment that I gave you, all right, from a pitching perspective, it seems as though that the subscapularis, all right, for the 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 the, the players that experienced pain, it seems as though the subscapularis fired last or had some type of delay. And for the individuals who did not have pain, the subscapularis fired first. Now, that's just according to your article. Now, I don't exactly know what the correct order is, and I don't think that the article is necessarily purporting that that is the correct order. But there seems to be a correct order. Now, can I read about that correct order? Where do I read about that order? And even if I read about that order, the organization of these muscles, I can't just tell my muscles to fire in that order, right? So how do you think, Zach, or anybody else, Jasmine, Jose, how do you think, and I'll go to Jose, because he plays baseball. If you're not on the call, it's okay. I'll go back to Zach, but. Jose, how do you think that this order here is established? Um, I am here, by the way, but um, can you repeat the question for me, please? Yeah, let's say I have four different rotator cuff muscles, and all of these rotator cuff muscles fire to pull the humeral head into this shallow glenoid fossa so that the glenohumeral joint, the shoulder joint, can be stabilized. Yep. All right. How, first of all, how does anybody know what that order is? And if you could figure out what that order is, how do you establish that order? How do you make it so that your muscles can fire in that order? Can you tell them to fire in that order? Uh, I mean, you can't, you can't tell them. Uh, you got to basically, wouldn't it be more of like, like, I don't know, getting not used to it, but like knowing how to use it, I guess. Like, I don't know how you would tell your muscle to do it like in the order you want. I mean, I think that you are sort of alluding to it. I think that what you have to do is you have to practice. Yeah, like it's more of like, I don't know. I feel like baseball is a, baseball is a sport of a lot of muscle memory. So I feel it's just a lot of repetition so you can get it down and make it happen so it can be the same every time you do it. Okay, so I think that you're getting to it. It's practice. It's repetition. Okay? Mm -hmm. I would say it's also probably using things like progression. Repetition. That's supposed to say repetition. It's okay. We'll keep it like that. And I would say things like progression. So 
rather than and when I go watch the Red Sox and you have a player in the bullpen and they're warming up, they don't warm up immediately with a baseball and go and start pitching. Usually what you'll see is they have like um, bungees. They have um, drills that they do. Um, and I would say that probably in the beginning of the season, everybody's on a pitch count. And what happens is they practice, they repeat the motions, they use lower weights and then start to increase the weight and increase the number of pitches. And as they move on to their off season training, all right, but these things right here, these terms right here, latency and synchronicity of the muscles, those are all derivatives of timing. And the only way to develop these things is not necessarily to be aware of the correct timing. It's not an awareness of these things because we're not really aware and my brain doesn't even know what the correct timing is anyway. But just like with the point A and point B and you have length emerges out of that system, this timing is an emergent property of using the system and through practice and through progression and through repetition of the movement, this timing has an opportunity to emerge out of nowhere, not cognitively. The timing emerges because now what happens if I say, for instance, change the system? Instead of point A is Daniel being a thrower and point B is the ball. What happens if I change the ball and all of a sudden I use a much heavier ball? You've all experienced throwing a Nerf football, not all, but some people may have experienced a Nerf football after it gets waterlogged at the beach. All of a sudden this whole timing has got to be reworked and you throw that football the first time and you're like, oh man, that hurt my shoulder, right? Because you have a new, a new system here. You have a new characteristic and throwing that football 40 feet for the first time without any ability to progress and increase the strength needed to slow down and my eccentric um, ability of those muscles slowing down that heavier football is just not there. So the timing can't emerge, the eccentric ability to slow down that heavy force can't emerge. All right, so one of the things that we want to consider in regards a mechanism for injury is not just the overall strength of the muscles, and the, the muscles here are important because they are the stabilizing factor in the shoulder. They are the things that cuff this shoulder joint so that not enough, not too much force is going through the system and pushing the tissues into the plastic region. If they're not strong enough, both concentrically and eccentrically, but also if the timing is disrupted so that the muscles fire too late, even a millisecond or two, or if the timing between all four of them isn't organized, then this whole stabilization of the glenohumeral joint is in question, and that's the mechanism for injury. It's not overuse. It's overuse with, uh, with not enough strength eccentrically or concentrically. It's overuse with poor latency or poor synchronization, or it's overuse with not enough practice to establish these things, or it's overuse without enough repetition or without proper progression that is the mechanism for injury, not overuse. Overuse is the description. This is more the explanation behind the term overuse. Okay, so that's why after COVID, if Jose just goes out and plays toss with his friends and he's throwing heat, well, it's not that he doesn't know how to throw a ball or that he hasn't done it in the past. It's just for the last four months, his timing 
has suffered somewhat so that his muscles are firing late and they're not synced with each other. So for some period of time, when he gets back to throwing, he's going to have to go through his progressions. He's going to have to repeat those motions. Now, how many times do you have to repeat those motions? I don't know. I'm not sure. Even, even not even like just like when I go four months without throwing, but even like, let's say I threw two days ago, even if I go throw today, like I'll start like progression, like I'll start short, like throwing short just so I can like kind of warm up because like, like you said, if I go out there and just throw a baseball, go out 40 feet and throw for the first time, I'm going to feel the pain on my shoulder or elbow. I mean, you're just pushing those tissues into their plastic region. Yeah. I don't, I don't think I want to do that. No, definitely not. That's where you're going to have rotator cuff tears. Yeah. Need my rotator cuff. Uh, yeah, I would say so. And, you know, like, let's say you have, uh, um, you have a, um, an orchestra, and the orchestra is playing a piece of music. And everybody in the orchestra is a very talented musician. Well, if I give that orchestra of 100 people a piece of music and tell them to play it the first time, there's no way that it's going to sound beautiful because there's latency between the musical instruments and the people, and people are not synced up. But after they repeat and repeat and repeat and practice that song, eventually it's not their ability to play the instrument that improves. It's the timing between the parts of the system that's going to improve. And that's going to make this, the music sound much better. How many times do they have to play that piece of music? I don't know. I don't know if there's an answer to that. But with practice, with repetition and progression, the parts of the system that is the orchestra or the parts of the system that is the rotator cuff will allow for the latency and synchronization of the muscles that stabilize that humeral, that glenohumeral joint to emerge. That's not a cognitive process. That's an emergent property of many different muscles working together, working with a ball, working with, you know, um, gravity, working with concentric and eccentric muscle contractions. And when you get it right, then what you have is a shoulder that's stabilized and that can maintain its structural and tissue integrity. All right. So I think that that's probably enough for today. Does anybody have any questions about what we just talked about? Pretty sure we just went over a number of mechanisms for injury associated with the shoulder. We talked about the balance between structure and function. The fact that the shoulder needs to be mobile reduces its structural integrity. That's a mechanism for injury itself. We talked about torque at the sternoclavicular joint. All right, and how distributing weight further and further away from the sternoclavicular joint could cause more of a bending force on that joint. We talked about stress strain curves with the acromioclavicular joint and increased forces for too long a period of time without rest in between could push that ligament into its plastic region and cause that ligament to tear over time. And we also talked about how reducing the force and rest and maybe making a new way to spot or to lift or to do those things could, could reduce that injury potential. And we also talked about the, the strength and um, both concentric and eccentric strength of the rotator cuff muscle and their ability or their responsibility for stabilizing the glenohumeral joint and what happens if the timing of those muscles is disrupted. Um, and the latency or the synchronization of the firing of these muscles is in question. And then how to overcome that with practice, repetition, and progression. All right, so that's pretty much what we discussed in regards to mechanisms for injury at the shoulder. All right, I hope that you guys 
are able to take a look at the YouTube videos. Now, I, um, I scanned the next chapter for the shoulder complex in your Canvas site, so you should have that. Everybody's exams are graded. What I'll do is I will scan them and send them back to you. And if there are any questions that you feel as though you'd like to try to answer over again, feel free to do so and email me the, uh, the corrections and try to give you at least partial credit for anything that you do. All right, anybody have any questions? Uh, no, I think I'm good. Oh, I have a question. Yes, ma'am, go for it. Is there actually like a machine or a way to figure out what the correct order of firing is or no? I mean, I think that that's one of the reasons why I'm pre uh, presenting that new, um, the article to you for your homework assignment. I don't think there's necessarily the correct order. Like when we were talking about turning to the left, if you had four different steering wheels, I don't mm -hmm. think that there is necessarily a correct answer. All right. Mm -hmm. I think that one of the beauties about the human body is that there are redundancies. You can probably achieve the same stabilization or the same result with a number of different orders. So mm -hmm. I don't particularly know. I'm sure with EMG and this particular article is going to show you a difference in sequencing and latency between the four rotator cuff muscles, but there's no kinesiology book that says, fire the muscles in this order, that order, this order, that order. Mm -hmm. All right, it's more a philosophical question. Where does the order come from then? Mm -hmm. The order emerges. The, emer the order emerges because the, the shoulder um, needs to maintain its integrity. The, the order emerges because of practice and repetition. And I don't think it's necessarily um, one order versus another order. And it could be the case that different task is going to require a different order and um, a different weight of the, the ball that you're using is going to require a different order. And so there's probably, let's, the, the answer is probably unanswerable. Okay. Where does the order come from? It emerges out of the unique structuring of the system and the task and the need for that, that those forces to be dissipated. Certainly not a cognitive process. Mm -hmm. Okay, but I think that if you take a look at the article for assignment number three, it, I, it's as close as I can get to answering your question, Jasmine. Okay, thank you. Yep. Any other questions? I guess I do have a quick question just to try to like apply it to something. Um, so like during a pressing motion, when we like retract our scapulas back, um, would that be in order to like consent we uh, contract those um, rotator muscles and stabilize the shoulder joint, like for bench press. Is that what, why we do that, or? Um, I could answer like, like this. In, in gymnastics, okay, when you're on the rings, you're supposed to turn the rings out, okay? You can't, when you're doing like CrossFit and you do a muscle up and you get to the top, you don't want to have the rings facing in this direction. You want to try to turn the rings out. Now, in gymnastics, if you have the rings turned in, it's a deduction. You can lose points. But do you want to turn the rings out solely so that you don't lose points? Or do you want to turn the rings out because that fires your infraspinatus and packs the shoulder joint? So when you're on rings, you have a more stable framework because the rings aren't stable so you have to increase the stability of the shoulder joint itself right so i would say that it's like a chicken versus the egg you know it's a deduction because it doesn't look good but it's also a deduction because if you don't turn the rings out then your shoulder's not as stable and you're just not going to be as good at rings as if you did turn the rings out so there are aspects of technique in lifting, in everything that are going to increase the stability of the joints that you're working with. Now, when I do strength and conditioning with the kids in the gym, some of the kids are younger. Some of the kids are, you know, 11, 12, 13 years old. 
Some of them are older, 15 years old, but they've never used weights before. So it would be silly of me to do things like farmer carries and um, um, push presses and pal off presses and things the very first time and give those guys weights. So when I start strength and conditioning and I go through the month of July, I'm sorry, um, May. So during May, during our off season, we do strength and conditioning and I don't let the guys use any weights or any kettlebells at all. If they're going to start, they'll start towards the end of May and the beginning of June with very little weight, three pounds, five pounds, and they always get frustrated. Why can't we use more? I can lift more. I can lift more. I'm strong. So it's not about that. What we're trying to do is we're trying to establish timing, right? That's why progression is important, especially if you've had time off of the particular activity. Start no weights, work on technique training, work on progression, start low weights, increase weights, monitor what they're doing. But yeah, Zach, I think that there's, um, there's, um, there's not an ending point between technique and structure. You know, so whether or not the technique is solely there because it looks good is probably not the case. Most of the techniques that you're going to teach people and help people understand is most likely because what it's doing is it's making a positive impact in, in structure. Right. Any other questions? No, thank you. Okay, buddy. All right, I'll get that posted ASAP. Hope you have a good day. Keep rocking it. Have a good one, Professor. Thank you. My pleasure, no problem.